So this is the contract that we wrote in the last lecture uh, in terms of solidity. Uh, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to push this into uh, the test net of, of Ethereum where we've set up a couple of accounts. Um, so let me find the Ethereum client, which is somewhere, here it is. So we have uh, a main account with one Ether, we have Alice and Bob, they're both holding one Ether. What I'm going to do is I'm going to push this simple storage contract from Alice's account. So how do I do it? So we've seen the, the overview of the wallets, um, the two transfers that we've, uh, of one Ether are now in our list of trans transactions as well. And uh, we are familiar with this interface, which lets us transfer money between accounts or between uh, contracts. And uh, now we're going to use this, uh, this tab. Uh, so this is the last tab, which is contracts. And so what we're going to do is we're going to, uh, well, let, let's say what it, it allows you to do. Um, so what it allows you to do is deploy a new contract. Um, they also have, uh, there's some features that we didn't talk about maybe in, in future iterations of this course, we'll go into kind of the layer that sits above your smart contract, but there's different hooks you can put in your smart contract so a user interface can um, meet, sort of watch it and update its uh, variables and things like that uh, for you. Um, and then they also have a, um, a built-in kind of custom contract that, that's also very common that a lot of people want to do that, that involve uh, creating your own kind of like currency, uh, which are called tokens, uh, which exist on top of Ethereum. Uh, we'll talk about tokens probably in the fintech applications. Uh, but for now, uh, the option we want is for custom contracts. Okay, so we're going to deploy uh, a new contract. So here's the contract uh, uh, interface. Um, so the first option is which account do I want to use uh, to push uh, this contract? And I forgot, uh, but uh, as it turns out, you can actually launch a contract from an, another wallet contract because the wallet contract is a contract itself. Um, so we're going to have to actually launch it from our main account, uh, which is a simple account. Uh, but but uh, anyways, well, let's circle back to that issue uh, in a few, uh, when we get ready to run functions and, and we decide where we're going to run our functions from. But um, okay, so we have a main account. Uh, it's the one that's going to, we're going to use to deploy the contract. Because of the way the contract is written, the main account will become the owner of the contract. Okay, so um, let me paste uh, the code in here. So here's the actual contract itself, and uh, it's just doing a little compilation of the contract itself. It's also very nice that you can just post or paste Solidity code uh, directly into it. Uh, you don't have to actually compile it. Uh, the the thing the the client itself will. Uh, compile it for you. Um, if you if you have bytecode, you can also paste it in, uh, so that's fine. But anyways, we have this simple storage, and remember we have this owner variable. And when we run the constructor of this, the owner is going to be set to message dot sender. Message dot sender will be main account, okay? Or specifically, message dot sender will be b eight zero three this particular address, okay? So this is the address that's going to get stored in that variable, uh, which is called um, which is called owner. Okay, so uh, we don't want to send any ether initially to it. Later when we run in a function, maybe we want to, to send some ether along. Uh, but for now, we're not going to send any ether. We're just going to create the contract. We'll have to pay the gas fees, but this is ether on top of the gas fees that we might want to send into the contract when we create it. Uh, note that the constructor is not marked as payable anyways. And so I, I won't even be allowed uh, to send Ether even if I wanted to send it. Uh, I can pick a fee. So uh, this is toy money, so I'll, I'll just make it as fast as possible. And then finally, I have to pick the contract that I want to deploy. Um, so the reason that this interface exists is that your Solidity code, uh, because this is object-oriented programming, you might have a bunch of different objects or a bunch of different contracts in the same code. Uh, you're going to push them. Uh, and, uh, you know, anyways, if, if your code had more than one contract, you would have to pick the order that you want to push them in. Uh, this code just has this one contract, which is called simple storage. So it's the only one on the list. So that's obviously the one that I want to push. Um, 
And uh, finally, it noticed that, hey, you have a constructor and, and you're supposed to be passing in an integer uh, when you run your constructor. Uh, what do you want that integer to be? Um, so it says uh, there's this variable called x. It's an unsigned integer, 256 bits. What do you want it to be? And so I can click through or I can just type in a number. Um, so let's just set it to um, uh, something like that. And uh, OK, so now I'm ready to deploy. So I'll deploy it. And I'll find the phantom window, which is over here. Um, so this just reminds you you're about to, to move uh, no ether to this contract, but you are running a function. Uh, the function is actually the create a contract function or the constructor for a contract. Uh, when I ran it locally on my computer and I counted up how many byte codes it took me to push this, this was the amount of gas that it was going to consume. Uh, I might want to stake a little more just in case it ends up taking more on the network. And then I have to say how much ether I'm willing to pay per unit of gas or per unit of computation. And so I'm going to leave these all as the default. I assume my client knows uh, how to set these values well. And uh, I will just type in my password. And I'll click Send. OK, so that's done. Uh, it's sent. And uh, we can actually refresh this because this is the uh, if I recall correctly, this is the address that we just sent that contract from uh, on testnet. Um, so it hasn't been added yet uh, to a block. Oh, there it is. Uh, so it was added to this particular block eight seconds ago, uh, contract creation. Um, it's, we can take a look at uh, this actual transaction itself. Um, so you can see it came from here uh, to this contract. Uh, you can take a look at the contract itself. So the, the contract itself, simple storage, uh, it now lives at its own address. Okay, so simple storage now has this particular address. So let me uh, maybe ju just draw this out so that we, we have a proper mental model of what's going on. Um, so what I had is I had an account and it was called main. And the first thing I did is I created an Alice wallet. So that was sort of the first transaction that I used main for. Then I created a Bob wallet. Then what I did is I created a, um, well, first off, I transferred uh, funds. So the next thing I did is I uh, took one ether and sent it into Alice's wallet. I sent one ether into Bob's wallet. Okay, and then what I just did most recently is I created uh, the simple storage contract. Um, when I when I did it, I did set that integer, and. Um, yeah, okay. And then simple storage has its own address now. Okay, so all of these blue blobs have an address. So there's an address uh, where simple storage contract lives. Alice's wallet lives at an address. Bob's wallet lives at an address. And all of these came from main, uh, which is also at an address. Okay, so what I'm looking at now in Block Explorer is the address of the simple storage contract itself. Okay, so the address in here. Uh, happens to be 0, 9, uh, 9 DDC. I'll just I'll put 9 DDC, etc. Uh, you at home, uh, you you know, watching this, uh, you can even look up these transactions yourself uh, because this is actually pushed uh, to testnet, and so you have access to testnet as well. Um, so if you pause the video and, and make a copy and paste of, of this, you can take a look at it itself, okay? So anyways, this is the actual creation of this contract. Uh, it will show you different things. Uh, so this is what the bytecode ended up looking like. So it's uh, pretty small. Uh, this was the, the thing I passed into the constructor. Um, it doesn't know anything about this contract because we wrote it ourselves. Uh, so it's not going to show us the source code. Uh, you'd have to decompile this to figure out what the source code is. 
Um, and uh, there's these things called events that we didn't set up for this contract, so you can just ignore that. Okay, um, so, so anyway, so this contract is now live, so let's play around with it and we'll try and do a few uh, different things with it. So um, if I go back to my main client here, I can click contracts and you can see that simple storage uh, is here. Uh, you can see here's the address of it. It holds zero ether. Um, it will show you different uh, values uh, of the contract itself. So it knows that, for example, uh, there is a variable uh, x, uh, and x was storing this particular value. That was the value that we got um, that we passed in. Uh, so let's just go back to the code here. So store data is this. Uh, we also had a parameter uh, which we called owner. Um, and so you can see that it knows that there's a parameter called owner. Uh, owner is main account. It, it's smart enough to figure out what that address is and, and know that, that that address actually exists in this wallet. Uh, so it just shows it up as, as main account. And um, there, there's a few other things. For example, it knows that, that we set a getter function. And so if we run get, uh, it will return this. Okay, so now what we want to do is, um, what I want to do is I, I want to write to the, the contract, meaning I want to run a function on it. Okay, so uh, what I can do is I can see that there's two functions I'm allowed to run. Uh, well, there's two functions that are defined. Uh, one of them is the set function, and one of them is the done function. Uh, both of them have modifiers. So the set function says the owner can run it for free, uh, otherwise, you're going to have to pay. Uh, you're going to have to pay in ether, basically, in order to run this function. Okay, and then done is a function that only the owner can can run, and then it sort of destructs uh, the contract. Okay, so let's start by just running set by the owner itself, so the owner doesn't have to pay anything, uh, and then and then we'll we'll play around with the other options. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to click I'm going to click set. Uh, now we get to choose which um, what I want to change this variable to, so let's just change it to one, two, three, four. Uh, who is it that's going to send this account? So now functions can be run from both wallet contracts and from just normal accounts uh, in Ether. Uh, since this is the owner of the account, I'm going to run it first time. We'll run it from here, and then I'll, I'll show you what happens if, if you try and run it from the other accounts. And I'm not going to send any Ether along with it. Okay, so I'm just going to click Execute. Uh, then we have all the same types of uh, things, how much gas it thinks it's going to cost, uh, how much I'm going to pledge over and above the amount of gas, uh, how much ether I'm going to pay per unit of gas, that type of thing. So send the transaction. Um, and so anyways, this got sent. And now we just we just have to wait. Uh, for it, uh, we can take a look at on the Block Explorer website and see if we see this transaction show up. So what I'm doing is uh, you can't see me pressing the button, but I'm I'm refreshing this website looking to see when this transaction is going to get added to a block. So we're still waiting. Uh, we'll give it a few more seconds. If not, I'll just I'll pause the video and then I'll I'll come back when it's confirmed. Okay, so there it is, uh, 32 seconds ago. Um, you can see that, that this was the transaction itself. We can take a look at the transaction itself. Um, you can see that all of this, because it's bytecode, this website doesn't really know what this contract's about, that you're setting an integer. It doesn't know anything about it. It just knows there's a bunch of functions that were defined. One of them happens to be called this, and you were allowed to pass in um, a uint, and, and this is the uint that we happen to pass in uh, in hex. So that's one, two, three, four in hex. Um, and uh, yeah, and, and, and so that's it. Um, I'll, I'll note that sometimes people get excited about Ethereum and, and seeing a demo of Ethereum, but it's actually really boring. It's kind of like working with an Excel file sheet or a database or something like that. Like you just sort of pass in integers and then, oh yeah, look, like that integer actually changed. Um, but anyways, hopefully because you know what all the things that are going on behind the scenes that, that this is a little more uh, impressive to you. Um, but anyways, you can see that, that uh, this 
number did update. So now this number is one, two, three, four. So that operation was successful. Okay. Now the next thing we're going to do is we're going to try and run set again. Um, so this time I'm going to put it uh, to, uh, let's do 1024. And this time I'm going to run it from somebody who's not allowed to run this function uh, unless if they pay. And I'm not going to pay. Um, so what we're doing is uh, if we look at the source code, I'm running this set function. There's this modifier we define called paid. Uh, in this case, message.center equals owner will not be true. That will be a false statement. And I'm not going to send any, any money along with it. Uh, and so this is also end up, this will also end up being a false statement. Okay. And so um, now you might think, well, this, this function won't run. No, that's not true. So we have to have the right mental model here. This function will still run. Set will run. It's just going to hit this line of code and then it's going to throw an exception and return okay so the require will not be true it will throw an exception and it will revert but it did run okay so we did we did start walking through the code it just didn't run to completion okay and so the amount of gas that we pay and all of those types of things uh, will still be uh, exactly the same okay um, so let's just try this Um, so, sorry, I'm looking for the, the pop-up window that, that has all the details of the transactions. I've not seen it. Okay, so anyways, this is being a little buggy. Let me pause the video quickly and, and figure this out and I'll, I'll come back to you in one second. So I made some adjustments to make this work. So it turns out that when you send, uh, when you invoke functions from wallets, uh, there, there's some issues with it. I won't go into the details of it, but what I've done very quickly is set up just a basic account, a basic external account called Bob. Uh, I put two of the ether in it, and then we still have our main count, which uh, just has a little tiny bit of ether that's in it. Okay, so uh, let's go back to the contract, uh, which is here called simple storage, and we'll do what we were going to do before. So I'm going to run the set function. Uh, I'll try and set it to 1024, and I'm going to do it from this uh, external simple contract, or sorry, simple account uh, called Bob. And Bob is not the owner of the contract. So main account is still the owner of this particular contract. We can see it because there's a field here called owner and you can see that main account is the owner there. Uh, currently the digit is one, two, three, four. Um, and so I'm gonna try and set it to 1024, but I'm not gonna pay, okay? And so uh, as we mentioned before, that's gonna get caught by this modifier. Um, I'm not the owner and I didn't pay this amount. Uh, and so this should not work, but let's try it anyways. Um, so here we go. Um, it just gives a warning that it, it wasn't able to estimate the gas, uh, but it has a default amount, which should be more than enough. We'll see how much it ends up being. Uh, this is the gas price here. Um, so I'm gonna put in my password. Uh, 1024 is the, 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 the parameter uh, to the set function that we're running. Okay, so I'll send this transaction to it. So it says transaction sent. Um, so this should be good. And uh, what we'll do is um, we'll actually use the website uh, to take a look at this contract to see if we can see that transaction. So simple storage is stored at this address. Uh, so what I'll do is I'll um, go over to Safari and I will type in this address. Okay, and so you can see that uh, 22 seconds ago, uh, there was this transaction. Um, it's pending. Uh, so what that means is uh, the website has noticed that it's floating around in the equivalent of the mempool uh, for Ethereum. Uh, so it's floating around the mempool. It hasn't been added to a block yet. So let's just refresh this and see. Okay, so now we have it. Uh, it's in a block. Uh, so this is the block 32 seconds ago. And uh, you'll notice uh, if I click on it, you'll notice that it says fail. 
Okay, and then here it says, uh, warning, error encountered during contract execution, execution reverted. What does that mean? That means it threw an exception. Okay, so we did this transaction, we tried to run it, uh, it did consume some gas uh, for, for running it, but it threw an exception, uh, and so it didn't actually update the state of the contract at all. Uh, it just reverted back to the previous state. So if we go uh, to the, the Ethereum client itself, you'll see that 1234 is still uh, the integer that's in uh, that's stored here. Okay, um, so, so that was an example. Now, Bob can update this uh, integer. He can run set. Uh, he just has to pay. Okay, and so we coded it up so that he would have to pay one Ether. And so now we're going to run the exact same thing. Uh, so it's still set, still 1024, still coming from Bob. The only difference is we're going to send an ether along with it. And uh, in this case, we should be able to update this integer. So let's try that. Uh, so I'll leave everything as the default and I'll send it. Okay, so we have transaction sent. Uh, if we go back to our wallet. You can see that the, the list of the transactions are here. And uh, what I'll do is I'll um, go over to the website itself and take a look at it on the website. Okay, so I'm going to refresh this. And it's not showing up yet. Keep refreshing it. Uh, flip back to Ethereum. Uh, you can see that 1024 is here, so my client is thinking that that integer did change. So you can go back here and check. And so I see four out of 12 confirmations here, so this uh, was, was actually confirmed. Um, another thing, and this is a, a really key point, is notice that Bob and the main account, the balance has changed, okay? Uh, I don't know if you remember it, but before Bob had 1.95 Ether and the main account had 0 0.05. So what happened here? Well, Bob ran it, he paid one Ether to change that integer. The integer actually changed. And the way that we coded it up, if you recall, um, whatever the value was uh, that came in, uh, that was transferred straight back uh, to the person who um, uh, who, who ran, uh, who, sorry, sorry, who owns this contract. Okay, so main account is the owner. It's what's in message.sender. So basically what happened is uh, Bob paid one Ether. So he satisfied this condition. So it didn't throw an exception. It started running the set function, stored data updated to the new integer. Then we took the amount of money uh, that was passed in, uh, which is message.value, and we transferred that amount of money to the owner. Now, the way we set it up, we also had this helper variable called value, which we stored what message.value is. And so th what that means is that value actually sticks around. That's an integer that got set. So even when this function is done running, whatever the last value was that was in this value uh, uh, variable uh, will still be in the contract. So we can actually see that. Um, so let me just see if I can get, okay, so I just refreshed the website so you can see that the transaction is now here on the website itself. And if we uh, go back to the actual contract here, um, this is basically going to be confirmed any second now. I'll go to the contract itself. And so what we can see is that the stored data is 1024. We can see that value, so value here is that uh, helper variable, okay? So value is currently holding uh, the last thing that it held, which was message.value, which is one ether. Okay, uh, so this is uh, one ether. It's not uh, decimated in ether. It's it's decimated in the the smallest uh, amount of currency, um, but that's equivalent to a, a single whole ether. Okay, so that's uh, what's in that particular value, and uh, what we see here in terms of the accounts is that uh, that ether was transferred uh, from Bob to the main account. Okay, so let me just draw out what happened just to summarize it, uh, and then we'll kind of conclude our demo. 
so what we had is we had a situation where we have this contract simple storage and it had some internal state uh, and it was set to some number I forget let's I think it was one two three four uh, this lives at a certain address 9 D D C okay and what happened is uh, we had two people that are sort of involved. So there's Bob, Bob sitting here, and then there was also the owner of the contract. And so the owner was established when this contract was first put on the blockchain. Okay, so the owner isn't necessarily around. And then the way the contract was, was coded up is uh, Bob was permitted to run set 1024, but he had to pay uh, one ether. Okay, and so when th this was received uh, by the contract, this met the conditions, and so the state was updated to 1024, and the ether was transferred back to the owner of the contract. Okay, and that left the contract with no money. So the the contract itself has a balance of zero. Uh, that's something else that you can see. Uh, in the client um, itself. Uh, so you can see it here at 0.0, .0 ether. So it is possible that the storage would just sit on the money uh, and if it sat on the money, uh, well, there would be no way to pull it out, but there is actually one way to pull it out. So the one way you can pull it out is run this done function. So when you self-destruct, any money that's left in the contract gets transferred to the owner. So just for good measure, uh, why don't we uh, destroy this contract. Uh, so I'm going to run the done function. Uh, I'm going to send this, I'm going to um, run it from main account. Uh, we have a modifier here that only the owner, uh, so message.center equals owner, uh, only the owner is allowed to run this particular done function. Um, so we'll, we'll execute it from the main account uh, and then it will actually run. So we'll do this. So this transaction is sent. And uh, now what we can do is um, just go back to the transactions themselves. Um, so you can see that um, they have it denoted as a transfer, but uh, we'll, we'll let it pick up the confirmations. Uh, okay, so, so this is sort of in progress now. Um, Let's go back to the contracts. Okay, what I'm hoping to see is that uh, there's some notion uh, here that, that this is a destroyed contract and it, it won't show you any information about it anymore. I think we might have to wait for it to confirm or uh, maybe my mental model of, of how the wallet behaves is, is different uh, than it, what it does. Uh, let's quickly check the website since we have it open as well. So we'll see if we see that self-destruct uh, being run. Um, so I see it here. Okay, so I don't see any sort of indication that this uh, contract was actually, um, has actually been uh, self-destructed. Uh, I'm not sure what that is. I can, I can go offline once again and, and just double check uh, that I shouldn't be expecting to see something, um, but it might be the case that it just uh, fails to operate or something like that. I was looking for the user interface to, to communicate that fact to me, um, or, or maybe there was an issue with the function itself. But anyways, uh, this is uh, how the Ethereum wallet works. And so we saw a bunch of things like transferring money between accounts, setting up accounts, setting up wallets, running contracts, and you at least get a sense of, of what it looks like. Uh, the main takeaway I'd like you to take away from this is um, it's actually really not that hard, right? And Solidity contracts, I mean, our contract was very simple. It didn't do anything that fancy, um, but it, it wasn't a lot of code. 
uh, to write. Uh, it was a relatively simple contract. And you can actually push this. I mean, we pushed it in this case to testnet, but there's no reason why we couldn't have pushed this to the mainnet and it couldn't be a main contract that, that's just running on, on, on mainnet, uh, meaning that anybody can start interacting with it. So if you have some idea for what a decentralized app or a smart contract should look like that you think other people would be interested in using, um, the barrier to entry is really, really low. Uh, you basically just write a little bit of code you can just use the basic uh, Ethereum wallet software and, and you can actually push real code. And if, if your contract happens to collect money and maybe it's in the form of fees or that type of thing, then you can actually make real money. Ether has a real monetary value. It has an exchange rate with Canadian dollar or with the US dollar. And so um, the barrier to entry for this, this system is, is, is really super low. Um, so hopefully you find that enticing. Uh, and if not, at least hopefully just a little bit interesting.